Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick overview. The public lecture, obviously, we started a little late, so we'll do a check-in in around 5 and say if people need to leave immediately, you can leave, but we'll also be around for the dinner um, if people have more Q&A they want to ask as a group or informally. And then we have the workshop afterwards. Um, and the dinner's for workshop participants. And the dinner's for workshop participants. You probably <laughs> know that because you signed up with it. Um, and the workshop will allow for more hands-on engagement and back and forth to talk about your specific research because as you can imagine it's really hard to cover all the possibilities of all the expertise that's in this room as it relates to this topic. So as Susan was saying, part of these workshops is just a quick overview and we're trying not to cover things that are covered in the first one and the third one. Um, this is a quote from the co-founder of ScienceCom. Are any of you involved in SciCom? Um, it's a graduate student group that started at Harvard that now is national. You can follow their handle on Twitter. Um, they have a website and, uh, that talks about their annual conference and so forth. But it was a group of early career scientists at Harvard who said, some of us are going to use science to go and work in a lab the rest of our lives, and some of us are going to work in a lab but also edit a journal or become a science writer or um, know that we have to use a blog to keep fundraising going for our lab or something like that. So that communication is central to what the scientists are doing. And uh, Amanda Fries is one of the co-founders and of course as someone in communication studies I love this quote which is um, that we have a lot of reasons why there might be trouble with communication science but one of them shouldn't be a lack of communication theory. So just as a little bit of fill in, I started off as a scientist with a BS um, and then realized we knew a lot of stuff and nobody would listen to us. <laughs> so that's how I turned to communication. I met someone when I was 20 who was the head of the Sierra Club and he was like, you really should do communication. I was like, I've taken courses in basically every department at the university. I was a natural resource uh, major and a social thought and political economy major, both interdisciplinary degrees. And I was like, I think communication is like the only department I didn't walk in. He's like, yeah, a lot of people make that mistake. He's like, but I got Al Gore's number on my speed dial. What are you doing? And I was like, I'm 20, I'm doing nothing. So um, <laughs> I shifted course um, and Lee and I both have these sort of interdisciplinary backgrounds of which communication theory is an important part of it, um, but not the only part of what we do. So part of why a lot of us don't want to study communications because we do it every day, but that's like saying your heart beats every day so you can do cardiology. Um, there's actually a lot of thought that's gone into communication, how people do it, how we do it well, what failures are, and so forth. And now, as all of you I'm sure are fully aware, we have more communication through more mediums with more people in less time than ever before. So even if someone was an amazing communicator, like the uh, namesake of the Bartlett Center, who's a very revered scientist from Boulder, how many times did he give his talk? Almost 2,000. He gave his talk t almost 2,000 times. Can you do that today? No, none of you in this room, if you think you're going to make a career by doing one talk 2,000 times, I'm sorry, it's over. Because it's going to be recorded and it's going to be online and then you can't do the same talk again, right? We've radically changed the communication landscape. So things that were meaningful before change because we're in this larger complex. Um, and the, a common misconception about this complex is that we have one-way communication, and this often comes up with science. So um, it's named after Claude Shannon and Richard Weaver. Um, they were, it was a mathematical engineering model that was established to create telecommunications. And this is really important in information science. So if you talk to people in information science, this is... Um, sort of the founding, uh, along with Norbert Wiener, the founding of information science is this theory. And it was revolutionary for us to create computer information this way and big data this way. Because the way that this idea of communication works is someone who is a mathematician and engineer said, what if communication was codified into data and then we sent it out and then it had to be received and translated by another machine. And this becomes the prototype of how we have computers today. Right? So this can be really helpful. Um, some people use this all the time. Um, it assumes, however, when you apply it to science, 
sometimes that the science that the communities you're talking to the public you're talking to has no expertise right you've been training for a long time you have a lab you have a very specific area of expertise and oftentimes you're invited to share that information and you should be invited for your expertise I think it's important in January 2017 to just affirm that scientific expertise is very important I don't think I'll get arguments in this room um, but the idea is that well if I just share the information then people will feel compelled to act if I just told people that cars were a major pollutant of air water and land they would start using mass transit if I just told people when you use plastic bags it's going to affect the oceans and wildlife and oceans people will stop using plastic bags and we know that that works for a certain number of people but that also doesn't work for a whole lot of people once we put the information out there it doesn't necessarily get received the way we want it to be received it doesn't lead to the logical next step if someone believed our expertise or information and so a great communication plan that I really like that works really well because I just in case there's any information scientists that end up looking at this online it does work really well sometimes so if you have a campaign like opt outside I'm sure many of you being in Boulder have seen this campaign it's a great Instagram campaign right because you give an idea like opt outside and then people can affectively respond to it um, and then you can have people who say I'm citing um, opt outside from my religious group I'm citing opt outside nom 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 because I want to bite my boyfriend's ear um, it gives you this whole gambit that where you can talk to a mass public across various values not to say that Christians don't want to chew on their boyfriend's ears <laughs> but that these look very different and sound very different and are generating content for the people who created the idea of opt outside so this is a great one-way communication campaign that if you looked at the campaign it's saying we should go outside we shouldn't consume as much uh, this is a wonderful way to reconnect with the world and all the reasons we know we should be outside but then people can take that information and create new ideas with it so one-way communication can work but most of you when we're talking about dialogues today won't be dealing with that because communication also as you learn in elementary school from playing whisper down the lane does not always get heard correctly or the way you intended it to be heard um, it can be misinterpreted it can be translated it can have pushback people can receive it completely but people can reject you people can negotiate what you're saying they can say I kind of think that's true from an experience I had on the coast of Maine one summer but then I have this other experience I'm not really sure I believe you and you're like how do I tell them that I've studied this for many years and they should believe my data so part of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about dialogue is that communication is interactive and so that we have to think about also what are the different ways it gets received by different people in different communities um, I was talking to a scientist um, at my kids playground the other day and he was like I started to read the comments after he was on NPR and the other scientist popped up also from Boulder and was like never read the comments right which I think is kind of a mantra now um, of everyone in Boulder who's doing science right now um, but I want to bracket for a moment the non-persuadables that's its own lecture um, today what we want to talk about is people that you want to dialogue with not the person on the extreme who's like I hate everything you believe in I want to defund all the science in the universe and I've never believed a scientist in my life there's maybe a few people and we're just going to put them over there for another conversation the majority of people are in this negotiable space right where they believe they have knowledge to share about whatever you're talking about right it could be from their everyday lives it could be that they once knew a scientist it could be that they read a great article from a source they really believe in so anything from that source has to be negotiated with right um, and it could be because of different positions which the next workshops also on about power right um, but this is my mantra with the city of Boulder when we're working on climate communication is always as long as you enter every space knowing no matter who you meet with in Boulder and you want to talk to them about climate you have to understand they already have an opinion you have to start with that assumption right so most of you for whatever you're dealing with there's going to be some assumption or set of values that you're gonna to have to negotiate when you're dialoguing with the public about your science um, and of course the public sphere is not monolithic so it's not all the same right sometimes you're doing this broadcasting like the opt outside campaign but sometimes you're talking to people who um, 
Like I worked with a community on a landfill that had PCBs and some people I can say PCBs and they're like, great, let's go, let's talk. Carcinogen, I'm with you, I know what it is. And other people are like, you're speaking alphabet soup. I have no idea what you're talking about. What is that? Why I should care? Um, if it's in the landfill, I'm sure it's fine. The EPA made the landfill, I'm sure it's great, right? There's all these different responses people can have depending on their age, their health, their background, their educational level, and all these different questions that come into play. So what we want to sort of work through today as a brief overview of some concepts from communication that we hope to continue in conversation is that public engagement is not monolithic as well. So you as scientists have a set of choices about the way you would engage publics and sometimes you want to do more than one of these and sometimes you're like I'm only ready for one of these um, and that's okay too. But being reflexive about what your goal is with communication always helps. Right? And that's part of what we're emphasizing tonight. We want to emphasize that thinking about communication not just as the means to the end, but actually that process being critical to your work mattering to other people is very important. So that it might be, and there's many, many models of this. This is one model that's being used um, in Vermont right now by their city council. Um, but there's many, many models that uh, Leah will go into more examples when she's talking through a case study. But um, you could be at this point where you're informing people, like you've been asked to come in and talk about what is the soil size near the landfill or you've been asked to map how close the landfill is to the water table right in these cases you're being asked to go to the public and share something that you've assessed right based on your expertise um, sometimes you're paid for that through consulting and they might want you to give a recommendation I see these three options of how you could clean up this landfill um, but I really would recommend the community go this way yeah and then we go all the way to these other spaces about dialogue and interaction. So that's not when you're invited just to share information about a study you've done, but you're actually going into a space where you are at multiple meetings usually, sometimes it's just one, but often multiple meetings, and going back and forth and getting to know a community and their values and their knowledge, and that becomes part of the assessment of how a community decides to use science or not use science and in which way. And so tonight we're going to try to focus on this dialogue collaborative moment, um, but we just wanted to map some sort of broad assumptions about theories of communication. Um, and Lee and I have a lot of experience with many of these. I'll just highlight a couple. We both do lectures, so there's sometimes, even though we're in communication, where we're invited to inform people, and we go and we give lectures, and it's one-way communication, and we're not dialoguing back and forth. Um, Lee has also done, uh, she's been trying to use games to get people to think about flood management in Boulder, because everyone knows we're talking about floods, we're still talking about floods, the next year we're still talking about floods. <laughs> so how do you get people to say, I want to talk about floods again tonight in my spare time when I'm exhausted. Um, and so she's been trying to think of creative ways to engage people uh, through games, through using um, graphic artists or illustrators who will write as you speak. So you don't have to have the skill to have a graphic illustrator, but maybe when you would write a grant, you would say, I'd like to um, budget for one so that when I'm talking, they can draw beautiful pictures. For those people who are more visual communicators than uh, linguistic or oral communicators, yeah? Um, and um, I've worked internationally. I was at COPE21 as a delegate and um, as Susan already mentioned, locally with the city here in Boulder working on Just Transition Collaborative where we convinced the city of Boulder to make Just Transition part of their climate action plan, which was voted on in December. And there was many more people than those in this picture. Um, but uh, trying to think about how we can actually shape policy. So we kind of have this gambit of different ways that we communicate and engage publics and it depends on the ways we're invited, what expertise has been asked of us to bring to a public, and what is possible in a specific context. With that, I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Leah who is going to delve into a slice of an example to try to think through some dilemmas. So if you've been to Fort Collins in the last decade, you may have seen one of these images. Uh, as suggests, when people are willing to be naked and put in publication posters and plastered around the city, this comes from a pretty polarized conflict over a proposal to build a new reservoir, Glade, uh, north of Fort Collins. Uh, 
And in response to this really polarized conversation, there was a group of a public-private partnership in Fort Collins called University Connections that brought together the university, CSU, the city, and the business community. And they were really eager to try to improve the community conversation, in part because as um, the proposal was undergoing environmental impacts um, assessment, there was a sense that at any moment they could come back to the community and the community would need to inform them about mitigation markers and when people are having this moment they're not ready to make any constructive suggestions about mitigation right they're really focused on a single position on a single proposal that in this case they had no power over and these community leaders really feared that if that's where the community conversation was stalled that they wouldn't be able to make any kind of forward progress so this uh, uh, partnership ended up coming together and collaborating and putting together a series that co was called the Puder Runs Through It um, that had three different parts. There was a public dialogue session where about 300 people came and talked about the values they have connected to the river, how the Puder River is great for recreation, but it's also the place where Fort Collins gets all its water, which makes great beer and isn't that great. Uh, you had, And then you had a ton of people talking about what they found valuable and what was important to them and the questions they had. A public education series uh, where uh, different experts came and talked about water law and conservation and egg to urban transfer and all all sorts of issues that the Colorado Water Institute thought people should learn a little bit more about. And then these public deliberation sessions where people were in small groups, were of facilitated conversations where they were really able to work through trade-offs around the question of what does the future of Northern Colorado need? Um, I was involved in this process from the beginning, um, in part because I was uh, then at Colorado State, the Associate Director of the Center for Public Deliberation, and so we actually trained the students who ran that public deliberation series. I'm going to talk a little bit about this case using the process model uh, that my colleague Martine Carguson and I have developed. Um, that that's called deliberative inquiry. Uh, part of what this comes out of is an awareness that initially, when some of this work started, we thought we could just be down here. That like if we just get together people in a room to have different conversations, isn't that an accomplishment itself? Um, and as a communication scholar, I'd argue that that's true, but that work actually doesn't stand on its own. Um, and in particular ways, a linear event-focused model that just says like, have an event and you're done doesn't lead to the sort of community action and change that often this work is really working for, like co-governance and empowerment and ongoing tackling of wicked problems is not going to be solved by a single event. So instead, we started thinking about this whole process as deliberative inquiry, as a type of learning about issues, um, and often on issues you're going through the cycle multiple times, continuing to refine how you understand about the collaborative capacity of a group of people to solve things, understanding the barriers, the deliberative tensions that people really need to work through through in order to take community action on an issue. So we start with deliberative issue analysis. In the case of uh, the Pooter runs through it, part of what we're spending a lot of time doing is mapping analysis of both expert and public data. We had the benefit of working with a graduate seminar on water conflict where we made 25 interdisciplinary grad students map all the issues for us and we could think across all of that expertise about what they thought was really important for having community conversations. Um, but we didn't just kind of consult experts. We also had um, over 200 150 people at the event and an additional 100 online fill out survey questions about what they thought was valuable and important. And from that, we really tried to distill where the conversation needed to happen and try to figure out how you structure and frame an issue so that people can kind of jump in. Sometimes the form this takes is also doing stakeholder analysis of thinking about who can be affected by an issue. Um, and in thinking about the stakeholder analysis, the goal is that this whole issue analysis isn't just like summarizing the dominant voices that are already out there. It's quite intentionally trying to think about the large range of people who are affected. So in the case of um, this, yes, it was recreationalists and people concerned about kind of kayaking and seasons and people who owned property next to the river. It was also people downstream who were really thinking about whatever happens to Fort Collins, happens what happens in, impacts what happens in Greeley, and impacts the water rights holder in North Glen, right? So um, we took all that information and we did this. Now, I'm not expecting any of you to read a single piece of a single word on this, unless your eyes are much better than mine. Um, but this produced what we call the placemat, which was the one piece of paper that was necessary to have a two-hour conversation during that deliberative session. Um, now, for those of you who are like, water, the future of water in northern Colorado is a really complicated issue. You're talking about ag to urban transfer, and you have a single piece of paper? 
The goal with this was to analyze things as much as possible to put people and give people just the information they needed in order to begin to work through the issues. So the way this is structured is you have four different approaches and we spent time with each one. So talking about the focus on addressing growth, um, urban conservation, storage projects, and agricultural issues. We talk about what both what could be done, arguments for and against, and trade-offs within those. Um, and then try to, as much as possible, meet people where they're at and have them work through this rather than just listening to presentations. Uh, once you've done all of that, the next thing you have to do is you have to convene people. And this is harder than we sometimes give it credit for. Um, this comes to us from Arkong Fung, who uses this thing called the Democracy Cube, which is basically three dimensions where we make choices and we can think about a range of ways that we set up public participation. What's notable about this is once you've even identified stakeholders, you still have to think about how are you going to recruit them? There are certain processes where, for example, having a random selection of people is really important. You're trying to claim that your group of people is somehow representative of a greater whole. There's a process called the Citizens Initiative Review that tries to do this, that actually gets funding for five days for a group of citizens to come together and hear experts and deliberate with each other about an initiative and then they write um, up a review of the issue and it actually goes in the official voters guide in Oregon, right? In that case, who you have in that room is really important. So you don't want just anyone to show up, right? You want to make sure that you have a representative sample. In other cases, you want your, to think about a diffuse public sphere. You want to be as inclusive as possible, even though that creates other design challenges. The next piece about convening is you have to convince people to show up. And I would argue that this dimension is real important when you think about how you get people to show up, which is this is about decision making and power. If you're going to engage a group of people, what influence are you promising them over whatever action is going to be taken? If you're working with a local government, that's about, that's about working with them to negotiate whether or not they're really going to take whatever they say under advisement. Are they actually going to give them direct authority, like what this group of people decides is the thing that happens? Uh, <clears throat> more often than not, they kind of assume it's a little more on the other end, right? Like, well, people are going to come, it's going to be beneficial for them, they're going to learn a little bit about the issue, or maybe they'll have communicative influence. As you think about this dimension of influence and power, it's really important as an organizer to know what you're promising people. Right? What's their involvement part of? What control realistically do they have and what does that look like? Because if somebody's going to give up their time and the real benefit is for them, they should know that. They shouldn't come thinking that they're en engaging in co-governance. Okay. Uh, the next piece is the piece that, like, as a communication scholar, I spend a ton of time on. There's tons of models and we're just going to scratch the surface. But it's really thinking about how, what people are going to do when they show up. As Vedra talked about, I think this uh, dimension kind of maps the ways in which sometimes you have events and people are really listening as spectators. And that's important. They're eager to hear more, especially if it's a nation issue. They may not know enough to be ready to try to kind of deliberate and do other things. They may need more information to learn about an issue. Uh, but thinking about least and more intense forms of communication and expectations both helps you prepare people so that if you're going to be over on this end and you're expecting people to deliberate, um, some people n need a little bit of encouragement so that they know that they have to show up and talk and interact with other people, right? Um, versus if they're there mostly to express their pre-existing preferences. To be, as you get over here, you have to have a certain amount of openness to listening and interacting and building on what other people have to say. Uh, Part of what my job often is to do is to think about how you structure that interaction, but I'm also thinking, because this is an inquiry process, what data I'm collecting. I almost always um, record the interaction, we take notes, but we also have people do things like this. Um, in the water process, after each approach, we had someone, people write what they thought their biggest appreciation for the approach was, what they really liked about it, and their biggest concern. And part of what this does is it suggests that as the conversation goes on, people are processing things their own way. And this gives us a way of capturing the reasons that are most compelling to people. In public deliberation, at the end of the day, it's not necessarily on what people vote, but it's how they're reasoning and working through the issue so we can kind of take that and build on it. So this was an important kind of piece of data collection in addition to notes about it, what everybody said, in addition to kind of keypad polling about demographics and preferences and ordering of values and all sorts of stuff. From that, um, all of the raw data that we collect goes online, uh, but not surprisingly, transparency isn't always access. 
right? Um, many of you are trained to deal with large amounts of data. But just because the data is public doesn't actually make it meaningful to anyone. And so part of an important piece of what you do in here is what you're reporting on, what you've been listening for, and how you listen for particular things and report on that to advance the conversation. Um, and often when you're reporting, I'm thinking about things like barriers to collaboration, resources for collaboration, um, issues and tensions that continue ne to need to be worked through. In this particular instance, we are also listening for the potential that the public was really struggling with some technical issues that they were eager for scientists to help them address. And in particular, there were some questions about the environmental impacts of water projects that really called for creative solutions, but they kind of said like, we think we can figure this out, and then they would like get stuck, right? This was really an opportunity where technical experts could kind of feed back into this and provide information. Likewise, with agricultural conservation, uh, there was a strong value around agriculture, and there was a desire to also acknowledge that people were going to sell their water rights because it was profitable for them to do that. So the real question was, was there a possibility that we would have some ag to urban transfer, some selling of water rights without losing local agriculture? Where was the tipping point? Both of these requests ended up going uh, to a working group that formed coming out of this that spent the next year as a working study group taking on these issues, coming up with some initial um, answers and actually bringing them back to public convenings. Um, this happened in 2011. It's actually a group that still exists today. And that initial cycle of deliberative inquiry I suggested to you has now gone through like eight times, right? Part of what this suggests is that single event didn't solve water in northern Colorado. We still live in a desert. Population is still growing. All sorts of things haven't been figured out. But it's a sign of how you can think about how engagement gets embedded within ongoing inquiry processes that go in and out of a public focus, and in this case, also kind of spur certain types of engaged scientific action that also addresses some of these technical issues so it can kind of feed back into itself. Um, all this is to say, this is a single example. This comes from another pr um, case actually working with some engineers here on campus around flooding. But as you think about these kind of approaches to engagement, um, they can easily be embedded in a variety of scientific work on this campus. And part of why I think Phaedra and I are so eager to do this workshop and to talk with all of you is to give you just a sense of those possibilities. So with that, I think we're there.